after a break and of getting excited about this topic. We had a great morning session and we're getting ready to go morning two sessions and we're getting ready to dive into session three where we're going to learn from business case examples that use elements of the value proposition for exploring whether an investing entity should proceed with financially supporting a defined CPD. Before we get started and before I introduce our panel, <clears throat> I wanted to mention to our webcast viewers that they are uploading the slides, the current slides, and if you don't have access to them, to refresh your works, um, the workshop website and they should be uploaded. So there are slides available for the webcast viewers. All right, first up this morning is going to be Lucy, and Lucy will be providing us a high-value CPD example on the need for sepsis care training. Following Lucy, Mark Bowden, with 17 years of experience in physical therapy as a clinical practitioner, therapy manager, and research physical therapist, will give us an example of high-value CPD from physical therapy. And third, Amy Dean, who is a certified in critical care nursing at VCU, will be speaking with Kristen Miller, a pulmonologist also at VCU, describing another example of high-value CPD from the medical respiratory intensive care unit. So, Lucy, we'll get you to come on up and start us I, off. I'll We're right there. Right That's Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to use PowerPoint slides in full disclosure. And while you're um, getting your handout out, it's either page 15 in the handout or page 71 in the book, depending on where you're pulling it. And I'm going to try and present this very quickly. So if you have questions later, please feel free to approach me. I'll be here all day and tomorrow. Um, and I want to give you perspective. So I work at Intermountain Healthcare, which is a fully integrated delivery system in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I, I must say that uh, many of you may know my boss, Brent James. Um, Brent James is a world leader in quality and safety um, training. And one of the things, if you sat in on a lecture of Brent's, he would tell you is that just for a physician, over the course of a physician's working history, they will have to relearn their profession at least six different times. And it's almost physically impossible to keep up with the literature given a busy practice schedule. And so we really view the, the continuing professional development as being a responsibility of the delivery system. So I will preface everything by saying that it's a little easier when you work in that environment to make the business case. Um, so know your customer is, is the moral of that story. Um, I'm going to give you an example that we're working on with the High Value Healthcare Collaborative. The High Value Healthcare Collaborative is a collaborative of 14 delivery systems um, looking to transform the way we deliver care and pay for care in the United States. We're all over the country, um, and, and I can talk more about that later. But the thing I would say, and, and you learn in doing this kind of collaborative, large-scale training and learning is that you the context of the local marketplace is so critically important um, what are the cultural issues what are the state regulations what's the payer mix in that particular community because how you sell that business case locally is going to be very dependent upon those kinds of features in the environment um, the, the problem with sepsis, it's the leading cause of in-hospital mortality in the United States. Um, and we know there's very strong evidence that early identification and treatment of sepsis saves lives. Um, the, the, there have been a number of national campaigns around this. The CDC has come out with guidelines around this. Um, but nevertheless, there's a requirement for training. Um, and what I've tried to lay out for you here is, um, you know, the, the fact that there are both indirect and direct costs and benefits. There are ways in which you have to think about turning intangibles into tangible benefits that you can actually sell in making that business case, that they're external influencers, and I've already mentioned a number of them. Um, so, for example, in the state of Utah, if you train nurses, you have to pay them separately over time. You cannot do that training as a part of their routine job function. Um, and that's an important cost to know about that doesn't exist in all of the states. So knowing those state regulations is, is important. And then the dynamic evidence base. Sepsis is an area where there's a lot of problem with credence of the sepsis bundle. 
um, and a number of physicians are raising questions. You have to push a, a large bolus of fluids within a very short time period. And if you're practicing in Hawaii where you have Tongan population, where maybe you have a 700-pound patient, the ability to push that level of fluids in a three-hour period is almost physically impossible and may pose a risk to the patient if they have congestive heart failure or if they have renal failure. And so there are a lot of issues around the credence. The evidence is changing dramatically. And so what we've tried to do is to implement the three-hour sepsis bundle across all of these delivery systems, given the various um, contextual issues that they're facing. And so what you see on the list here, and I'm not going to go through all of these, is just a list of the perceived benefits and the perceived costs. But a couple of things I want to call out for your attention. Um, one of the, the main benefits and what was the biggest business case um, sort of driver, if you will, across all of these institutions is the potential threat of a penalty by CMS. Um, that, that was a, a big penalty. So it doesn't even currently is, exist. It's the anticipation of a future penalty and trying to get the measures right that got people to sort of buy in and invest the resources that they needed to at this point in time, irrespective of the contextual factors, which I've already noted are, are very important. Um, the other issue here is increased um, uh, positive patient experience. And when you think about that, that's a real intangible. What happens when you have increased positive patient experience or family positive experiences? One of the ways that you can begin to quantify that is loyalty, so that you have people coming back and having loyalty to your delivery system. Um, and, and we've been able to sort of sell that, if you will, in making the business case. Another um, piece on this is um, really thinking about not just outcome measures, but process measures. Um, so a lot of the outcome measures with different things that we do are very distal, or they're removed from the time period that we do the training and we're looking to observe an effect. This is a big problem in evaluation science. And so one of the things we try to move to is to more proximal process measures. So in this case, a process measure would be um, documented compliance with the bundle or decreases in the time to treat. Those are ways in which we can sort of quantify um, progress that we're making in our particular organizations. Um, and then I, the other thing I would say um, is thinking about how can we defray costs by looking at partners. So instead of Intermountain alone working on the three-hour sepsis bundle, we're working across all of these organizations and we've created an internet platform where we share resources irrespective of issues of intellectual property so that training materials that were developed at Mayo Clinic can be used. We just you know, put somebody else's logo on it, and that can be used at Beth Israel Deaconess, it can be used at UC San Diego. So we're not all recreating the same training materials over and over again. Uh, the clinical decision support tools have been mentioned earlier because we need reminders on the training, particularly when the evidence base is changing. This is a, a particular issue. Um, and so it's not like you come and get trained and then you're trained for the rest of your career on how to treat sepsis. It's changing. And so the extent to which you can change those tools um, and um, think about evidence-based practice and the care process models that are going to be updated and changes with the changes in the evidence um, are particular um, important um, opportunities for us to think about. Um, and, and I would just say that um, one of the other issues here that I, I've heard echoed in a number of the presentations is sort of resiliency of the clinical workforce. And um, I've done site visits to all of our member organizations um, and, and um, really talked in depth to clinicians of all ilks, you know, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, nurses, physicians. And in talking with them um, at one particular organization, there was a story I heard from every single type of provider that I spoke with. And it was an example of the lipstick lady. And I kept saying, well, who's the lipstick lady and what is that? Um, but basically, it was um, demonstrable proof and it became a part of the sort of ecosystem of that institution where because that woman was identified early, treated early, she never left the ED and was sitting up in the ED gurney applying lipstick when they were getting ready to transfer her to the ICU. Um, and that for those clinical teams was an enormous proof 
of the work and value, aside from all the data we give back to people and the evidence we give back to people so they see the effect of what they're doing. Um, we've talked about data and the need for sort of near real-time feedback so you don't forget the cases, but the lipstick lady story prevailed. Um, and every, nobody was asking questions any longer. Why should physicians give up and make it a nursing-driven protocol? Um, how do we use our rapid response teams to extend um, our ability to respond very quickly and, and treat early because of the lipstick lady? So I'll leave you with that story. Thank you.